This is session four of Torna Aegeus' adventure through Baldur's Gate. So, in session three, quite a few things happened. It was pretty nuts, actually. The highlights are Torna and his crew discovered Moonhaven, which is kind of a city near the middle of the map, and then the Goblin Camp. He used his tadpole powers for the first time. He met Raphael the Devil, and he met the Drow um, during his sleep as a dream visitor. All of this was wrapped up in trying to find the druid healer Halson, which he could not. So one of the big questions I had to ask at the start of session four was, what is Torna going to do next? I think I said in session three that Torna was in way over his head in what was going on. And uh, after Lazile almost slit his throat that night in camp, he went to bed and needed to come up with a plan. Well, what I did is I uh, dove into his backstory a little bit and came up with a few more guiding principles for Torna to help guide decisions. So we know that Torna is last of the pagan bards, and as a part of that, he's connected to nature, but has been surviving as an entertainer uh, because at some point in his past, the pagan bards disappeared or left or whatever got uh, destroyed, and he had to kind of make it on his own. Now, Torna, uh, you know, being a part of the, the last of the pagan bards, he knows that he has this special lineage, um, but there's always kind of been a doubt in his mind, you know, if he's the last of them, you know, why aren't there more of these bards from this order? And why is it, uh, if, if this was such a special thing, why is he the only one left? Um, after the events of session three, a devil, Raphael, coming to speak with him, this dream visitor, Torna is has very high conviction now that he is indeed special, like he's inherently special. However, he does also know that he needs to challenge himself to achieve great deeds like the pagan bards um, are sung about in legend. So that's one of the guiding principles from now on. He's going to be searching for great deeds so that he can be like the pagan bards of old and all the songs he knows of them and, and the legends. The other guiding principle is like the pagan bards of old, he may need a patron to help him on his way, but just like the pagan bards of old, no one will ever own Torna Aegeus. And so that's kind of wrapped up into what's been happening with um, <laughs> this this tadpole, this parasite from the Mind Flayers, and all the people who seem so nice in trying to help him alleviate that problem. That brings us to session four then. What is the goal for Torna and the crew in session four? Three things. Number one, uh, they found a, I had forgotten to mention this in session three, there was like a little hidden uh, hatch that they found um, underneath the windmill where they saved their friend Barlow, Barlow Root. So we're just going to go look at that. Number two, we're going to go kill an owl bear because nothing screams great deed like hunting a ferocious beast. Uh, and then number three, if there is time, um, continue to explore. I was actually looking at the map at the end of my 3.5 session and there's a lot of uh, adventuring space still here that um, has not been really looked over. So um, those are the three things that we're going to do, or at least try to do in session four. So the first thing that happened is Torna and the crew went under the windmill. There was nothing there. I mean, there was like uh, a few things there, but um, I think maybe Barlow Root's bag was down there. Uh, when he was saved, he mentioned that he's only traveling light from now on because it was his bag that slowed him down. So... Uh, I got a few items, but nothing crazy. Uh, from there, we went back to the owl bear den, and uh, two things happened there. First of all, we found found a shrine to Saloon, or Saluna, um, Salune, Saluna. It turns out Saluna is a rival god to Shar, and we found out last session that Shar is Shadow Heart's god. Shadow Heart was not super pleased that we were there. We also found a magically protected chest with some items inside of it. We had to recite a prayer out loud to open the chest. Shadowheart not, was not happy about that, but we got some items, and one of them uh, helped us later with Gale, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we found the owl bear. Now, the owl bear, as it approached us, looked backwards. It looked, you know, aggressive towards us, and we realized, oh, the owl bear is protecting a cub. Now this changed the calculus in Torna's mind. He came here to achieve an almighty great deed of destroying this ferocious beast, the owl bear, so that he could sing about it in the future like the pagan bards of old. He didn't know it had a child owl bear there. 
And so all of a sudden his, uh, his, his attitude changed towards this and they were going to walk away. But I heard from some people that if you have the uh, spell speak with animals, you should cast it and talk to as many animals as possible um, because it might help you and blah, blah, blah. So I cast the spell and all of a sudden the dialog box uh, appears above the owl bear's head. So I walk over or I click the dialog box and uh, the, um, the owl bear uh, like comes up to talk to me. And then the owl bear says something along the lines of like, you soft fleshed people never listen when I say stay away or something like that. And then we were into combat. So it was a uh, kind of a bummer that we ended up going into combat since that was not Torna's intent. I think that when I clicked on the owl bear, I just assumed that the dialog box would pick up at a new place and not, you know, continue on the owl bear's aggression. Anyways, we were in combat against the owl bear. Uh, we used a lot of our spell slots fighting it, um, but we ended up defeating it pretty easily, uh, and, um, at the end, there was a, uh, its cub was still alive, and Torna had the choice to basically euthanize the cub or let it live, and just, kind of, Torna just said, I'm gonna let it live, we had to kill Nettie two sessions ago, there's been a lot of death, uh, and the owl bear seems like it's gonna be doing just fine, because it started eating its mother as soon as its mother died, so, uh, that was kind of gross, we got out of there, uh, with a little bit more loot, a little bit more experience, and we started exploring. We found some weird stuff. Okay, so first of all, we found a dog who was basically protecting its owner. Since I could talk to animals, I found out the dog's name is Scratch and that his owner was killed by some gnolls. Now, we briefly saw gnolls um, along a road right where Raphael the Devil showed up, uh, but we backtracked out of there because they were too high level for us at the time. Um, I offered Scratch to come to our camp. He said he wasn't going to, and I said, because his owner needs to get up uh, after he's done taking his nap or getting healed or whatever, and it was pretty clear his owner's dead, so I just like, well, come to my camp if you, you know, if you need to. Um, we're just going to let Scratch kind of uh, hang out there in the wilderness till he realizes what's going on with his owner. Then we kept on exploring, and we found... Um, uh, an area just, I think, south of Moonhaven, uh, the city that's overrun by goblins at this point. Uh, and we found two brothers who were picking on Auntie Ethel. Now, I haven't talked about Auntie Ethel yet. She was in the tiefling camp. She was a overly nice woman who offered, like, healing and stuff like that. She wanted to dote on Torna and, um, like, kind of clean him up and make sure that he was feeling good and uh, we were busy, so we didn't really talk to her that much. Um, and these brothers are claiming that Auntie Ethel uh, kidnapped their sister. And something seemed off to Torna, and the brothers definitely seemed overly aggressive, but they're from the tiefling camp, so is Auntie Ethel, and there's no reason for them to be out here. I mean, if they were going to harm poor Auntie Ethel, there's a million ways to do it besides shouting in the forest. Uh, and why was Auntie Ethel out here in the first place? So there's some alarm bells going off in Torna's head. So I decided to side with the brothers instead of Auntie Ethel, and I, I don't see anything about protecting her. Auntie Ethel then says something about how the next time you come to my doorstep, you need to make sure you gravel in apology, and she literally disappears, uh, which means that these brothers were probably right. The brothers, I, I offer the brothers to help. They say, nope, they take off towards the swamp, which I can now see off in the distance. So Torna and his associates follow the brothers. They get to the swamp and uh, it's the, Torna gets this thing. He seems like something, someone's watching him. And so he, uh, he kind of looks around and um, the swamp is all like bright and airy and that type of thing. And uh, he's able to see the swamp for what it truly is. It's There's an illusion cast over the entire swamp to make it look bright and airy, but really it's dank and dark and really gross. Um, there's a bunch of traps everywhere. Uh, and as we go into the swamp, we see red caps, level four red caps, which once again, I'm not really willing to deal with. Looks like they hit hard. So this whole swamp is an illusion. Auntie Ethel is somewhere in the swamp. These brothers ran into the swamp. So we are going to not do that right now. We're going to go back, keep on exploring uh, and sticking with the plan. So from there, we continue exploring uh, just uh, near Moonhaven. We find a mystery dagger and some meat. It's a, it's a magical dagger. So now we have that. 
Um, and at this point, Gail starts struggling a little bit. Now, I actually, this happened in session three. I forgot to mention it, but in session three, Gail was really struggling. He had previously told us a secret that he'd never told anyone except for his cat that he has to consume magical items or else he gets really sick and sick and destructive and so last session we gave him a magical item to consume it was a necklace that allowed him to cast fairy lights he did and he said ah thanks i'm feeling much better we did the same thing this time it was uh some metal boots that um i for some reason didn't think we needed but now that i'm thinking about it lazile totally could have worn them anyways at the time i was like nobody's gonna need these uh and he consumed the metal boots but this time he said that doesn't quite do the trick. The hunger is still there. I'm going to need to seek some calm and peace of mind before I feel better. I'm not sure why that didn't do the trick. So something's up with Gail. Um, it, I mean, he's actually consuming these items. I kind of have a feeling that like at some point, uh, if, you know, if, if the hunger does get to him and he, you know, we have to fight him in combat or something, he's going to have the power of all of the items we've given him. So I'm trying to be careful about what I'm giving him. And I've noticed that some magic items don't work with him. So when he goes, when I go to look at different magical items that he can consume, there are some magic items that don't work like it, it doesn't give me the option for him to consume which means that there's uh there, there's some logic behind that right there's a reason that some magic items uh could be consumed but not others um right now the only connection i can kind of see is it looks like the the better and more specific the magic item uh in other words the more expensive or the more rare the magic item the better he can consume it so um that's a running theory. I have no idea what's going to happen, though, with him. But he did have to consume another magic item this session. And, well, it's not assaging his hunger like it did in session three, which is a bummer because I, I don't think I'm going to run out at any point. But, uh, you know, maybe. Maybe I do. Um, okay, so at this point, we've explored a lot of the map. Um, there's kind of a bridge in the middle, uh, and we could go to the goblin camp again. Um, we have the swamp that can be explored, but there's level four red caps, and then there's another road to the north, but there's level four, there's hyenas actually over there and level four bugbears. And so at this point, our group is a little bit kind of level locked. We're almost to level four, we're level three though, and I really don't want to move forward until we have a little bit more basically till we're level four, I think we can start moving into those areas when we get to level four. So uh, I decided that we're going to head back to the tiefling camp. And from there, we are just going to kind of, you know, we didn't really explore the tiefling camp after we helped defend the goblin attack in the second session. Um, we just kind of went straight to the druids area, which we definitely want to stay away from if at all possible. So we went to the tiefling camp and uh, we just started kind of walking around and talking to people. We talked to a few guards. The general vibe of the tiefling camp is that they have very few warriors. They're very nervous about the goblins. Uh, and the, many, of the, many of the people who are warriors are very sick and tired of all of the killing and dying. Many in the camp just think that the best thing to do is run. They need to get out of there. But there's a few in the camp who say it's going to be a massacre if they leave because, you know, they're not fighters. They're not warriors. And I happen to agree. It's kind of a bummer that the druids are forcing them out because they could last for quite a while here. Although I will say, since I've been in the goblin camp, if a organized siege was planned against the tieflings and the druids, it would be very challenging for them to defend against it because the goblins have the absolute and whatever else on their side over there. So I think maybe actually the druid is onto something, whereas before I thought she was being a little harsh. Eh, I don't know about that anymore. I think maybe the druid Kaga is onto something. Speaking of the goblins organization, I went to see the leader of the tieflings. I forgot his name. Uh, basically, um, I said, you kind of got to leave. That's what the druid said. And he said, we can't leave yet. It'll be a massacre. And I said, I agreed. <laughs> so... The leader of the tiefling said, there is another way. If you go kill the three leaders of the goblins, then we will leave because that'll make the goblins unorganized, which means we will stand half a chance to get to Baldur's Gate. The three leaders of the goblins are Priestess Gut, uh, Rags, Ragslin or whatever, um, I can't remember that name, and the Drow. 
Guess who I think visited us in, at the end of session three? In my dream, it was, I think, the drow. So if we have to kill these leaders, we are going to be in trouble because they seem really, really powerful. It's possible that we can find them on their own and then the four of our group can maybe have half a chance against them, but that seems like a very, very tall order for the group. Um, so I don't know what to do about that yet. I do know I'll probably have to go back to the goblin camp sooner than later. All right, so a few other random things happened here. Uh, first of all, um, we went up on the walls of the tiefling camp, and there was someone looking out of a telescope, and that was, oh, that was kind of cool, but then all of a sudden, a bugbear assassin climbed up the cliff and was about to take out the person on the telescope, wat uh, watching through the telescope, and so we were able to intervene very, very quickly. It was not a challenging combat at all, and afterwards, we uh, talked to the person who just said, I need some peace and quiet. It's too busy at camp, but we looked through the telescope, and guess what we saw? We saw a red dragon flying and maybe circling for prey. Very cool. All right, that's, that's so fun. <laughs> um, that means that, of course, there's going to be a red dragon in our future. Joy. All right, then I went and talked to one of the, uh, they kind of seemed like mercenaries. Uh, they definitely are not with the tieflings. They were helping defend the, the well, they weren't really helping defend the tieflings against the, the goblin attack. They actually led the goblins right to where the tieflings are. Um, and I don't remember the guy's name, but basically he was with the druid Halson, who we want to find to help us with our parasite. And he said they had went out there because they had a contract from Baldur's Gate to find an, a relic called the Night Song. All right. And he said, we're leaving. We're going back to Baldur's Gate. But if you want the contract, it is yours. So we got the contract for it. We now have a quest from some unknown patron over in Baldur's Gate, where if we find this um, this Night Song relic, which might be a sword, I didn't write that down, but that seems right from memory. Anyways, it might be a sword, and if we find it, we can go to Baldur's Gate and get a lot of money, or maybe just use it, is my guess. Um, we, we walked around the tiefling camp a little bit longer. I found a way to get up like on a, on a back end of a mountain I had never seen before. Um, we went on a path and we decided to kind of camp up there on the path and figure out what to do next. Uh, and it was in camp I started messing around with some of the menus and I realized two things. Number one, I hadn't looked at my quests for a long time. So all of the quests had notifications. I was going through a whole bunch of them. Um, and one of the, the, the quests, the, the quest we had just gotten to go find the Night Song artifact, that quest actually um, had a few completion points already. Apparently, the ancient temple that we had searched around in, in session two, is the rumored resting place of the Night Song. So we may actually be going back to that ancient temple to start the next session because that might be a good place to uh, get the last few experience points for level four and find this relic potentially. Uh, we already found withers there, obviously, but um, you know that might be something worth doing. Uh, and once we hit level four, then we can probably go take out some of the red caps in the swamp and go find Anti Ethel, or even head north uh, where the gnolls and the hyenas are, um, or head into the goblin camp. I think it just opens up the paths a little bit, and I'm not going to be as worried about uh, really, really challenging combats. Um, the other thing I found out was that you can actually look back at conversations and reread conversations in the menu. And so I went and reread Withers' conversation from session three. And uh, in session three, I was confused because he had said something about the cult of the absolute and the hirelings he was offering. And it was hard for me to tell whether or not the, the hirelings he was offering were for or against the cult of the absolute. I went back and read his statement, and this this guy is verbose, all right? Uh, his lexicon is gregacious. <laughs> it, he's hard to understand because he uses big words, and I reread the statement like three times. The best interpretation I have of what he's saying is that it looks like he is offering um, fallen cult of the absolute souls to come fight for us. 
I think that's what he's saying. And he says there's a lot of them because the cult of the absolute has kind of gone the wrong direction. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that. I might do it um, if I, you know, see a big battle coming up or something. Like if I know we're going to kill one of the goblin leaders soon, I might do it and hire a hireling. Actually, that's probably the worst idea ever is to use a deceased cult member of the absolute to fight one of the leaders of the cult of the absolute maybe i'll do it if there's a different type of boss battle another owl bear type type battle in the future just to see what it's like um anyways i also went and talked with the rest of the crew at camp um there was some uh the, the entire camp talked about the devil visiting us, the devil Raphael. Um, there was some sequencing issues in uh, the session three with how I told the story. So this would have been um, the devil visited after we took our sleep in session three. So this is the first time I've really talked to my crew about the devil Raphael visiting us and us going to the house of hope okay so the first person I talked to is Shadowheart now Shadowheart uh, Torna is drawn to Shadowheart um, everybody's lied to Torna in the entire game I'm pretty sure but Shadowheart's lies are so bad so when I went and talked to her and I said hey you know what's going on she said well what do you think about the devil and I say I don't think we should trust the devil and she says really because it seems like you know he might be someone who can actually help us with this and i was like say what like that doesn't make any sense that's not shadow heart at all like i was like is does she know something with like is char connected to this devil does she know something that i don't and so i kept on talking to her about it and i was like well i, I like wanted to draw her in a little bit so i said well maybe i'm changing my mind now maybe we should make a deal with the devil and then she said something snarky like oh really do you really think we should make a deal with the devil and I was like, what is she getting at? I was like, me as a person, I was getting confused. This is not normally how Shadowheart reacts or acts. Turns out that number one, Shadowheart does not think we should make a deal with the devil. But number two, uh, and I mean that like very strongly, she was very against it. But number two, I think she's actually a very good liar, like a very, very good liar. And previously I had mentioned that I don't think she's a very good liar at all. But she totally got Torna. She totally got me. And she talked about the tactics that deceitful people use uh, to try and get their prey off balance. And she says that she's been trained in those same tactics that so she can use them against the enemies of Shar. What a lovely conversation that was. And all of a sudden, you know, I distrust everyone, every single person in the party. Uh, Shadowheart just jumped to the top of the list of people that I distrust. Of course, at the end of the conversation, Shadowheart says something like, you are one of the only people I'm able to confide in. I don't know if I've ever been able to confide in anybody uh, like you. It's like, yeah, okay, Shadowheart, sure. So uh, not super excited about that. Um, and and her ability to uh, turn on the the lies like that. Um, went and talked to Lazile. Man, she is so straightforward about becoming the best warrior ever and riding a dragon and killing people for her queen. Uh, I just had to end the conversation. It was it was shocking how little she thinks about anything else. Also, when we're playing, when I'm playing the game. Lazile is just thinking about killing things. And like, for example, when I initially tried to leave the owl bear and the owl bear's cub uh, on their own because there was a baby owl bear there and we to leave the cave, which I accidentally did not do later, uh, Gale approved of that act, Shadowheart approved, and Lazile disapproved and said, no, we should go kill the owl bear. I mean, she's so bloodthirsty. It's so hard to connect uh, with with the Githyanki culture. So uh, she needs to stay in the party because she's, like, by far the best fighter and we need someone in that role. But, man, got to watch out for her. Um, but she doesn't lie. So I think, again, you know, I think I can... She's she's going to shoot shoot it straight, um, but she's not telling me everything about, you know, the Githyanki crash, which I... I'm feeling less and less as our... I'm feeling like that's one of our worst options, honestly. Went and talked to Gale. Um, Gale, I uh, mentioned his, his ability to consume magical artifacts. Uh, he talked about the devil, um, and he had a different take on it. He always seems to have a different take. Uh, he thinks that the devil is actually a little bit desperate and wants something from us. And he was saying, why would the devil come to us unless it actually needed something? 
uh, and he thinks it's connected to the mind flare parasites in our minds and either something that those things can give him or something that we can access that he cannot um he wants me to consider the devil's deal he said whatever the devil's first offer is it's probably an offer for your souls just reject that but the second offer you should listen to potentially and he said let's just let's just sit and wait and figure out what we can do uh, what we can learn and when the devil comes back maybe talk to him maybe give him a chance uh i think that's an awful idea honestly um I, I do trust Gail's analytics, so I think he's right about, you know, the devil probably does want something from us and is, you know, on some level of, of desperation. I don't think super desperate, uh, but I don't know if I'm even willing to engage in a, a deal at all, whereas I think it sounds like Gail is. So then I went and chatted with Asterion. Asterion really thinks that this devil has an upper hand, and he said something along the lines of like people who like to play games don't play games that they're not already that they haven't already won or something like that. Uh, it seemed like there was a lot of pain in his eyes. It seemed like he's had some trauma, some past relationships that have gone poorly with people. Um, hopefully not with devils, but with people who you know toy with their food before they eat it and that type of thing. Um, Asterion his view on the devil was very refreshing after Gale's because, uh, like I said, Gale's very analytical. And I was like, yeah, maybe Gale does, or maybe the devil does need something from us and we can make a deal that isn't, you know, totally one-sided. Asterion, Asterion's viewpoint basically said, no, no way. The, the devil's already won if he's asking you for something. Um, I already talked about Withers. The last person I went and talked to was Volo. Volo had nothing new to say, uh, which means we are um, done with the updates at camp. So heading out to uh, session five, I'm not exactly sure what's going to be happening. I'm likely to be heading back to that ancient ruins, go through there, hopefully level up to level four. And then I think that there's three choices. I think we can go and try and figure out what happened with the brothers and Auntie Ethel in the swamp. I think we can head north of Moonhaven and head up to that road, take on some gnolls and bugbears and hyenas. Or we can go back to the goblin camp and start messing around a little bit more there. We still need to find Halson. Uh, we need to find um, some of the goblin leaders at some point uh, to potentially kill them in the future. But I don't know if I even want to do that. You know, it, we'll see. Um, and there's there's probably some more uh, exploration to be done around there. I was treading very, very lightly when I was around there. And I think we can... Um, we can do a little bit more exploration. So that is all of session four. I will be back for session five. Next time with Torna Aegeus. If he's not fed, he could erupt and he would take out a city as big as, what city did he say? I can't remember. Um, Waterdeep, a city as big as Waterdeep.